Welcome again. Anne Gad is a writer and artist, and she's been studying the Enneagram for a long time, 15 years. She's authored, I think, four published books on the Enneagram and a staggering 22 other books, mostly in the self-help or psychological domain. Her Enneagram books are Better Parenting with the Enneagram, I think that's the newest one, the Enneagram Kids series, Sex and the Enneagram, and the Enneagram of Eating. This was a really fun and exploratory conversation about creativity and where it overlaps with inner work and the Enneagram. I think you'll find a few pearls here from someone who is really practiced in her creativity muscle. I know that for me, I will probably now carry a little of Anne's lighthearted approach in my creative endeavours, and I think that that will serve me well. I hope that you enjoy. First of all, um, I think all of us are creators, and I think I've always been essentially in a process of creation, whether it was art, whether it was cooking, whether it was creating a garden, um, painting, writing books illustrating books. To me, there's a wonderful, playful aspect about life if you kind of engage with your creativity. So I have, I think right now, had about 37 books published. <laughs> 37. When was your first, when did you write your first book? Um, How many years ago? I was about 21. Mm-hmm. I thought I would write a Mills and Boone. So I wrote <laughs> Sea of Remembrance. Um, and in fact, in those days, it was all um, hand typed out by a friend of mine. And um, I sent it off to Milton Boone. And interestingly enough, I got through two stages. I even went to their offices. At the end, they said it was a bit cynical. Too cynical for Mills and Boone. But that would be a really low standard of cynicism. No, I'd also said it in St. Ives, which I had visited. But it was obviously clear to them that I hadn't lived in St. Ives. Um, but yeah, that was my first entry into writing. And then for a long time, I didn't do any writing. And then I started doing um, Reiki and uh, foot therapy and various alternative therapies. And from those, I wrote my three books, in fact, on habits. So why we do the things we do and the emotional reasons behind those things. Mm. Then on the art side, and I've always created, um, and I suppose now I've probably done about 6,000 paintings over the years. You know, on the one hand, you take the two professions where rejection is very much part of the way of living. But I think that in embracing rejection, it gets you through that fear of it, which I think is what puts so many creative people off. They get rejected and then that's it. They don't do any more. It's something one has to work through as a creative person. And then I was very lucky. I mean, to be able to wake up every morning and to be creative, it wasn't always like that. You know, I, I did at some point have to put my kids through school and yeah. educate them and pay off their mortgage and those things. But um, it's always been a privilege to be able to learn from my creativity. Do you have like a preferred form of creativity? At the moment, I'm very excited because I'm trying out one of those iPad things um, for my latest book and I'm doing drawings on that. And that's really exciting because, I mean, it's just like, Every time I do something, I'm like, oh, wow, oh, wow. You know, it's, um, in fact, just before I spoke to you, that's exactly what I was doing. I think the scariest for me is actually a painting. Facing a big white canvas, I have never been able to quite get over that. And some days I find it easier than other days. I mean, my husband's also an artist and he puts on very loud trance music, you know, in order to literally pump himself up to the point that he can get into the space that he can kind of create. Some days it's easier, particularly when you're trying something new, a new style, a new direction. And then whatever inevitably seems to happen is that the first one kind of works and you are, oh, wow, this is amazing, this is fun. I'll just do something similar. And then it doesn't work. <laughs> and then you find yourself in that dark hole and you have to do a lot of self-talk and you know you find yourself procrastinating even put the washing on the line rather than yeah. go and face yeah. this. <clears throat> but I mean I think art is a muscle and I think if you don't exercise it regularly it does become more scary to go there you know with writing some days it just flows beautifully and other days it doesn't and I find the simple practice that I've learned is to actually do something creative but mundane 
to get through that block. So I will go and paint a wall in the house um, that needs painting or do, doing something so that at the end of the day, I can feel I've achieved something. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is when we get anxious about the inability for the magic to happen. Let's let's get a sort of definition of, of creativity. And so we're talking about quite a specific kind of creativity right now. And that's like the, the more common association. So creating art or creating a, a book. But when I say the word creativity, what what does that conjure for you? The whole universe is in a stage of creation or destruction, constantly engaging with one of those forces, even if we're not aware of it. So Basically, we're the canvas. Mm. And what we do in life becomes what we create on that canvas. Uh. You know, how we do it, when we choose to do it through creating a garden, an app, um, a software program, painting, a sculpture, music, dance. To me, that's fairly irrelevant. I honestly believe that we cannot be truly content or at peace with ourselves if we are not in some way creating, and that's all of the Enneagram types. The same as we have a deep desire to create intimacy with others, we have this incredible desire to engage with that creative aspect of ourselves. And so often so much healing happens just simply by engaging with our creativity on some level. And that the alternative force was, was it destruction that you said on the other end of the polarity? Yes, well, yeah, there's got to be a, Balance. Let's talk about inner work. So obviously you've you've been doing a lot of that as well alongside <laughs> creating and you've been working with the Enneagram for some time, along with by the sounds of it, other I don't know, developmental framework. I think I became a bit of a workshop junkie at one point. So yeah. If there was a crystal workshop, I'd done it. You know, um, whatever it was, um, it excited me. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to understand more. And, and so I did all these different things. But it was almost when I found the Enneagram, there's still so much to explore that I haven't felt the need to do a huge amount more workshops and send on other subjects. That's not to say there's not value in everything else. Of course there is. But this still manages to intrigue me with high speed. And I, I, I never stop learning. And that's why I love it. And it, it's so, and in some ways, brutally truthful. To quote Russ Hudson, it can be um, a bit of medicine, I think he said. I thought I knew myself before the Enneagram, and I realized now that I really didn't have a clue. Yeah, there's still so much to learn um, with the Enneagram it, and so many different ways to use it and look at it. But engaging in inner work, does it help us to understand the creative process? And if it does, how does it? The creative process is intrinsically who we are. I used to run workshops called Create Yourself. And Really, what we put on that canvas is an expression of our inner selves. Through creating through the lens of the Enneagram, it gives us another way of understanding our creativity because our type obviously is going to influence how and what we create. Perhaps not to the same extent as the instincts, but it certainly um, is going to affect us. And also, obviously, what goes along with that is or how our types and their neuroses are going to, or fixations are going to inhibit us from being creative, from reaching our potential. In having understanding of our type, we can become aware of where we're blocking our self-expression on all levels, not just on the canvas. Self-expression and creativity are very linked, aren't they? Absolutely. I don't believe anything that we create doesn't in some way reflect our inner, inner world. Um, you know, we're really taking here and putting it on the canvas. And I mean, I ran these creative expression workshops for 12 years, and I never cease to be humbled and amazed at how revelatory our creations are. 
we had spoke about before we met how when it comes to creativity the instincts are more important than type so I'd love to know how you learned this and whether this means that working to be more balanced in our instincts is more essential to unleashing creative energy than say working on our type patterns look I think both are important But I think your instinctual drives is a much stronger force. One of the things I love about writing is finding this thing, being an explorer in a new land, and then you find this thing that, well, I haven't seen that plant before, you know. And when I wrote um, Paint by Numbers, Art and the Enneagram, what I really got excited about there was the realization of how much our creativity is affected by our instinctual type. So in a very brief way, if we are self-preservation, they probably make the best business artists, you know, the people who know how to run the business of art. And they would definitely be more focused on creating a secure income from their art. So they wouldn't mind being repetitive because if the paintings are selling and they're doing the same thing, well, then why not just do the same thing over and over again? Because, hey, it's working, it's bringing in income. So the motivation there would be, how do I use create security and safety from my art and build up a business and looking at all that sort of functionality. Whereas if you're more socially inclined, it's more about how do I climb the ladder of success in the art world? How do I get fame and power and recognition? And, you know, what do I have to do to achieve those things? Am I going to spend a hell of a lot of time on social media because that's engaging with the public and that's what I want to do so then the third type is what can I do to provoke others what can I do to use my art to get that sizzle and it can be a good or bad sizzle you know um, it can be something that's you know that creates a negative um, response but it creates some response it creates some action something exciting something vibey and so that's where your focus is going to be if you're a more sexual artist you know I think that's important that we should be aware of where we're coming from and then maybe try to balance it out so that if we are let's say self praise what if I engaged with a bit more of that sexual aspect of myself that's maybe a bit dormant and how do I do that how what do I do in my creativity that's maybe going to risk my security but it's going to create that interesting interaction that I want from another person in a way what we're doing is then using this awareness this information to help us develop the instinct that's least developed. So art then yet again becomes another tool for our development. Yeah, that, I mean, that, it, that all makes sense. And, and so I guess the sequence is important as well, isn't it? So it's not just what your dominant instinct is, but yeah, maybe looking at what the blind one is and so what the neglected creative yeah. juice would be. Yeah. But, it, but you see, it gives you the opportunity to say, okay, this is my least developed instinct knowing what I know now I can actually start engaging with the type of art that will help me develop that instinct so maybe if I'm sexual I need to learn a little bit more about self-preservation as an artist so that I'm not starving every month so that I don't have all these paintings piled up in my in my garage waiting to be found by some non-existent (laughs) curator you know that I actually become more business focused you know what I mean? So it's a practical way then that I can take my strength of being sexual and 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 start developing that least developed self-preservation. Is this, is this something you've actively done or or have you been so practiced in creativity that you've not needed to do this? Right, I'm on the spot here. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah. I'm just curious. No, not at all. I don't mind at all. Um, that, that You see, I think I've engaged in different times with all three. Mm. So I believe when I was supporting the kids and having to educate them, I was much more self I had to be. I had to be self-preservation. So I had to come up with something that I could sell lots of, that I could guarantee that I could pay the school fees at the end of each month or, or whatever. So in that part of my creativity, yeah, very much more self praise And then there were other times, I think, when I was looking at new ways of creating where I was much more sexual. But I think the difference is when I was doing it, I wasn't conscious of what I was doing. And now in hindsight, I can look back at the different series that I did and I can see them as coming from uh, different instinctual variants. But 
I don't think that I've really got the social media one whacked. Quite frankly, I'd rather promote than constantly. I do put stuff up, but constantly be putting stuff on. They'd make that. I mean, the creativity has got to be the focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got no resources that I want to put that way either. I mean, in terms of regularly updating an Instagram or on social media. So let's say this podcast I see as a as a creativity of sorts and um yeah as long as I'm making it and I'm sort of offering it in some way that's enough for me I'm not I don't really want to be promoting heavily every episode because I I just feel like it would take my joy out of making it and maybe I would have less energy to actually do it and plan for the conversations I don't know is is that anything like your experience with it I think it gets back to what would I prefer to do a drawing or spend hours trying to find out how I should do this thing on social media? Mm. Um, it's, it's a very easy answer. I suppose, in a sense, the creativity almost ends with the person receiving it, doesn't it, Anne? Do you ever think that? Like, so we can create and then and then it stops at us. But, but it's yeah. a bit like if a tree falls in the woods, does any does it make a noise? It's a bit like that. Well, you hope someone's going to buy that tree that fell in the woods <laughs> yeah. and take it home and hang it up. And <laughs> I mean, you and I are on completely different. Your, your books are out there in the world and you have publisher and so, of course, you have a platform. So it's different. Yeah. But as I say, it's not, you know, the cre- it, it, it always gets down to the creativity. I mm. mean, even from gardening, you know, the enjoyment comes from planting all the things and seeing them grow. I mean, it's lovely harvesting stuff. But I often forget to harvest the stuff because the, the enjoyment was watching it all grow and the little shoots coming out and all that stuff. Love that. Okay, um, I've taken us off um, on a tangent here. Do you think, uh, do we have time to go through what what each type teaches us about creativity and what sort of blocks they might experience? Yeah. We can choose types if we don't have time to do all of them. Um, I've got it very succinctly written here. Great. So let's do all the types. So let's do what inhibits each type from achieving the full creative potential. Any of you who are familiar with type one, it won't be a surprise to find out that it's the need to be perfect. So it's that looking across to the person in the art class next to you and feeling that they've done a better job than you have and then feeling inadequate and theirs is much more perfect and what if I don't get it perfect and what is perfect and so you very often can identify ones in art classes because they might start drawing in pencil first so that they can rub it out if they make a mistake you know they'll do it small because it's easier to control something small so all of that's inhibiting so if I if I'm with someone who I suspect may be a one um, I encourage them to actually just go big, just to enjoy, just to express themselves, you know. And sometimes I'd go as far as putting a blindfold on them so that they take away the judgment, you know. How can you possibly fail if you can't see what you're doing? Briefly, that's, that's, that's the one. And then the twos, it's often the belief that you need to help others. So twos will often set aside time to, to be creative, but then not end up showing up because they've got to help this one or take that one or bake cakes for this one or or even if they are there, they'll be trying to help the person next to them or encourage the person next to them as opposed to focusing on their own creativity. And with threes, it's all about I've got to be the best. If I'm going to do this, I've got to read every single book on how to be the best at whatever form of creativity I've chosen. I got to watch all the YouTube videos. I got to get this nailed, you know, and there's nothing like that to inhibit you. And then with fours, it's the need to be unique, not boring. So, so much emphasis goes on how can I be different and not necessarily on actually what I'm creating. And my head is focused on almost pushing myself to be creative in a way that actually maybe doesn't really sit comfortably with me, simply because of my need to be seen to be out there and different and special. And so I think that can become a very inhibiting factor. And then with fives, it's often the need to research before I do something. So my husband's a five, and when he started deciding he wanted to be a full-time artist, 
I mean, he would spend days with nothing being produced because he was researching other artists, materials, the right models. I mean, it just went on and on and on, you know. And at one point you're saying, well, when are you actually going to? You know? <laughs> and then with sixes, it's the need to have affirmation from others. So what should I create? Hey, what do you think? You think I should do the rabbit or the cat? Oh, okay, the cat, okay. Um, which style, which technique, which, I mean, which way should we go here, you know? And all this uncertainty, and yet sixes know. They know, they have all the answers. We all have all the answers, but they do. And they don't, it's, so it's, it's getting to the point where they can create without needing to affirm what they're creating with, you know, there's no phone a friend, you know? Yeah. And with sevens, it's all about not being present with what they're doing, but looking at what they could be doing in the next best thing. So, yeah, I'm doing this painting, it's fun, but, you know, the next painting I'm doing, I'm going to actually try this and this and this. And then when I get to that painting, well, yeah, this is kind of working, but it would be so amazing if I did that and that and that or, or painted this and this. And that. So you're never with what you, you, you never experience any joy of what you're creating. You, you constantly pushing yourself into a future experience. And with eights, it's more about the need to feel that art is something to be worked against and something to be controlled. So it's me up against my art, bold, brazen, going against the world, rebelling, um, never mind what the galleries say, I'm going to do it my way. Mm. Which is not a bad thing as an artist. I mean, Picasso was an eight. But if it becomes all-consuming, then it becomes almost like a, a war against the world as opposed to actually engaging with our art. And then we get to nines. And I think with nines, it's that feeling that my creations don't really matter. Yeah. You know, I'll paint this, and, but who really gives a damn? Who really cares? You know, and I don't really want to become too famous or well known because then I have the potential that other people could criticize me and then that would create conflict. And I don't really want to create conflict. And also that I wouldn't feel part of the group. What if my friends thought that I was becoming above myself? So let me just keep myself small here because that's the safest place to be. And so I shrink my art. That one's sad. They're all sad, but that one's really sad. You know, that was incredibly efficient. I feel like... I guess I was most struck by number six is, and it, I'm really thinking about someone I was working with a few months ago, and um, she was a six struggling to commit herself fully to her writing work. She kept deferring to practical income generating work, and of course, that's a very that's a very generic challenge for lots of people, isn't it? It is. It is, a, but because essentially we're all types. And if you go, if you follow the tri-type thing, well, that's already three types, then you take the wings and all that stuff. So we're going to look at, at um, you know, what are, are good practices for creativity. And when I was writing out a list, I realized that, in fact, while some may apply more to certain types, it, inevitably they apply to all of us, mm. no matter what our types are. Let's do those now. Um. So some of the things that are great practices for creativity. Oh, a quick shout out for Elizabeth Gilbert and her book, Big Magic. Ah, I love um, that book. Yeah. The most fantastic book. So fully recommend. <laughs> Elizabeth, you can thank me later. Oh, uh, okay. So great practice for creativity. Let go of the need to control the outcome. Enjoy the journey of creation. Be open to the happy accident. Tell me more so about that some, Well... Sometimes you can be doing something and the cat knocks over the water, let's say, on the painting and it leaves a big splodge. And you think, oh, my God, the painting ruined, bloody cat. You know. And then actually when you look at it, you think, wow, you know what? that's created an amazing effect. And I so often find that with accidents or people asking me to do things that I don't particularly want to do for a commission or something, that it actually pushes me to find a new way of creating. Uh, that I wouldn't have done if that hadn't happened. So, yeah, accidents, I think, are fantastic things on canvases. And in life, actually. Yeah, I love that. Creativity is a way of being, isn't it? It's just adapting to curveballs that seem negative. Yes. Yeah. And failure 
the only failure is not to, not to be great, not to do, not to hear that voice inside us saying, hey, what if you did this? And to listen to the other voice that says, who do you think you are to do this? There is no other failure. And find what inspires you, you know, and follow the path of that inspiration. See where it leads to. Don't let social media become your creative focus. Mm. Because then you're looking for affirmation from everyone else. And whilst that's comforting, it can inhibit your creativity. Likewise, don't compare. In the beginning, fine, emulate great artists. But most importantly, find your own way, your own unique expression, no matter what form of creativity you're doing. So you get the most satisfaction from finding your, your unique expression. And we all have it within us. I mentioned this earlier, but accept art as a muscle. Some days things flow with ease and other days not as much. It's just like sport. You have better days and not such good days. And rather than try to fight against it, just go with it. Accept that this is not that day. You know? um, but don't stop creating on those tough days because on those tough days, you could be on the verge of a major breakthrough. These all sound like good good self-talk as well and, and you do need to talk to yourself a lot uh, when you're in a creative process don't you well most of the time you're on your own mm. and while the pets make comforting company <laughs> um sometimes they're not that good in terms of motivating you so I think this does help you get through those times when you feel that things aren't working and you start letting doubt creep in and why did I ever start this project? Who am I to, to take on a project like this? You know, all that self-doubt that comes in. If energy is water throwing, flowing through a hose, those doubts are what constricts that hose. Mm. As we've got maybe a little bit of time left, um, can you, because you've written these books, you've written books on sex and the Enneagram, parenting and the Enneagram, and um, what's the other big one on the Enneagram that you've written? Eating. Yes, um, eating. Enneagram and eating, yeah. And yes. then the children's series of yeah. books. Yeah, I can't wait to, to give my niece and nephew both. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what, um, how does that go? Is it like, you get clear that you want to tackle that particular overlay. So let's say eating and the Enneagram. And then is the process of writing it generative of the insights? Is that what happens? Because that's what I imagine happens. Um, yeah, I think I find an idea that fascinates me or intrigues me. And then, sorry, I'm just going to do a punt for my other book, um, yeah. Art and the Enneagram. Mm. Um, yeah. But I think, I think yeah, you, you, you find an idea that's intriguing and it's like, it's like a path through the woods and you see this figure beckoning you and you think, oh, I wonder where that's going to go. And you start down that path. And sometimes the path gets a little rough on your feet. And sometimes they like appear to be four different directions and you're not sure which direction to go in. And the secret is to just keep walking. Yeah. And, then, and then it's, so you have an idea, but it, it sort of evolves over time. And I find that, um, you know, thank you, Auntie Google, because, when you start, then you sort of almost get led to different sites and you find really interesting things and fascinating. I, I get very excited when um, it's very five-ish, but when I join to disparate ideas and I find that they correlate, um, that they're connections between the, those two different ideas. And that's really exciting. And then, then you do feel like I mentioned earlier on an explorer that you're going on this journey and you know, maybe or maybe not, you're the first person to have seen this place. And that's exciting. But because the universe is the way it is, there are probably 50 other people on the same path somewhere else <laughs> also getting the same insights, you know. For sure. Um, you, know, you know, nothing has never been done before, never will no. be done before, never, you know. Yeah, but not by each it, not by each unique individual I guess and I always I find that a very comforting idea like where, whenever the voice of oh this is nothing new comes up it's just like well no one said it this way no I mean every year thousands of books get published on yoga but people still yeah. publish books on yoga you know and 
I think I think it was Karen Mace said once when I went years ago to a workshop of hers. She said, you know, everyone gets seeded for with like different ideas, often at the same time. But it's whether you you take that seed of an idea and develop it. And if you have been seeded with an idea, then you have the potential to bring that idea to fruition. So self-doubt doesn't need to be there because you wouldn't have had the idea if you couldn't potentially do that. We can't afford to be self-conscious about our art and our creations, can we, Anne? Well, that's one advantage of being a nine because nines aren't really self-conscious. Yeah. And so, and we like to play. And so we, you know, it's, I mean, every type has obviously the benefits. Um, and that is one of the benefits of nines is that is that we can play and we can be unselfconscious. And yet I have to say when I wrote Sex and the Enneagram, um, there was a lady who was helping me um, just go through it, just check me back to me and stuff. And she said to me, you know, and I could sense your absolute terror. Because as a nine, you don't want to create offense. And here you do are writing a book on sex. You know, um, so sometimes it does take a lot of courage to do things. But I think if your belief in the idea of what you're doing is strong enough, it gives you enough momentum to do it anyway. And look, I'm fairly safe tucked out in the bottom end of Africa. Got to That's stay. true. <laughs> so all else fails. You can just hide. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. This has been so good. I'm looking forward to listening to it again on the edit. Yeah. The next episode is with Dr. Frederick Kern, and we spoke about his incredible work on sex and human sexuality and the Enneagram. Do not miss that one.